Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to our research uh, presentation webinar, MRL Diagnose and Treat Your Research uh, Problems. Uh, today is our third session, and it is going to be on barriers uh, to cervical cancer screening in Colfe Caranio Subsidy at the Sabah Ethiopia 2022. Uh, our presenter is going to be Absara uh, Bakalu. She's uh, 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 MSC and MPH holder. This is her thesis work, and she's planning to um, publish it so it's um, on a manuscript faith uh, to be submitted for a journal. And our um, reviewer, our invited reviewer, is going to be Dr. Meseret, who's a, a gynecology oncology senior fellow at St. Paul Hospital Millennium Medical College. Uh, he is not only a very um, enthusiastic uh, clinician, but he's also a passionate researcher. And this is what we, the, the whole platform is about, to help clinicians become good researchers so, so that they can contribute uh, not only to the clinical practice, but also to evidence-based practice in the country. So uh, we're glad to have you here today, Dr. Masarat, and the in-house reviewer will be me. My name is Tegis. I am a medical doctor and public health specialist, and I am the founder and general manager of uh, Medical Research Lounge. So uh, we're uh, straight um, going to the presentation. Uh, Abstra, uh, you can start presenting. Uh, please uh, follow her attentively. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Uh, my research study was on barriers to cervical cancer screening in Gulf Creek and City in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. <clears throat> it's uh, my presentation outline. It includes the introduction, objective, method, results, recommendation, and the reference. Okay. Uh, cervical, as we know, cervical cancer is a process of detecting uh, abnormal tissues in the cervix before it develops to the cancer. Um, in Ethiopian cervical cancer screening uh, guideline, it says uh, every woman from age 30 up to 49 have to be checked for uh, cervical cancer uh, before it develops to the, the cancer to detect the precancerous lesion. Uh, there are three uh, methods for detection of cervical cancer. Mostly in Ethiopia, we use the VIA method. It's uh, cheap uh, and we can get it in every health center. But there are three methods in the HPV test, the pap the pap smear test, and the VIA test. <coughs> uh, as we know, the cervical cancer screening is uh, an effective method because it restricts early the precancerous lesions in uh, every woman. Uh, so uh, we recommend every woman to 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 screen for the cervical cancer screening. Uh, and now our my study is on the barriers of cervical cancer screening in colfe cranio subsidy and in development in colfe cranio subsidy. My objectives are to assess the utilization of the cervical cancer screening, uh, to explore barriers in cervical cancer screening. Um, okay, the sampling the sampling posture and this is a part of the sampling procedure and the sample size. Uh, <clears throat> the study subjects were uh, uh, <clears throat> the, was uh, selected by using the single population pro proportion formula um, by using the 95% confidence interval uh, and the proportion uh, the proportion formula for the, the p-value 27%. Uh, and the precision 5% in the sample size. By using this, we will cal cal calculate the sample size. It will be uh, 308. By using the design effect and 10% and risk uh, rate, the final sample size will be 518. Uh, to select this uh, sample uh, study participants, uh, we use systematic ram random sample, sam ram 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 sample Okay, uh, the quantitative study uh, we have to ask, uh, we discussed earlier, it is a sequential study. Uh, study. So we, it will include the qualitative and the quantitative part. The quantitative part will be, uh, uh, I will discuss the method, the quantitative method. The study area, as you know, as I told in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia from January, uh, the period was from January 10 up to March 10, 2022. 
the study method was for the quantitative part is cross-sectional study. Study uh, the source of population where only in conflict around subsidy. The specific minutes who are not volunteer to participate with the exclusion the study. Uh, the data collection method was for quantity part. It's interview rather than instead of questionnaire was used uh, as a tool. Uh, and uh, for data analysis, AP data and uh, SPSS 2.5 was used. And as the qualitative study part, the source of population was uh, study participants uh, who was participated in the quantity part. Uh, and uh, the study population was participatively selected, came four months from the quantity part. Uh, there was uh, around 15 uh, sample sizes for uh, positive selected. Uh, the inclusion criteria was came for months who had been who had uh, adequate knowledge about the committee and experience on the cervical cancer screening. As a exclusion criteria, we uh, used medical and physical enabled persons as in the profession who refused to participate. And total sample size was uh, 15. And data collection uh, and method and tool was used in deep interview and same structure interview guide and tape recorder and notebook was used for data analysis i used uh, audio tra transcribed and translated and into to open code software was used and uh, uh, in the study the result was uh, around 20 percent in the quantity part the 20 percent 20.3 percent was screened uh, uh, for the cervical cancer screening. From this uh, part, uh, after I completed the quantity part, uh, I used the qualitative part to support my quantity study. What were the barriers uh, to more explore by end point uh, of the part? Uh, there are for uh, barriers and social cultural barriers, and uh, the posture itself was one barrier. In this study, uh, in individual level barriers, I have, uh, I have, I got the lack of knowledge, partner, the support, fear of the time, low knowledge seeking behaviors, and conventional constraint and misconception about the screening was uh, the main uh, reasons for uh, not screened for the cervical screening for for cervical cancer. Uh, as uh, I have shown in this slide. Uh, one one uh, study participant was said that my husband did not believe in it. He is very strict in his religious. He believed that uh, if there is a disease, Allah may give mercy for us. In this part, uh, as I described in, as individual uh, level barriers, partner support is one factor uh, in individual uh, level, at individual level. And uh, the second part, uh, the second uh, theme was social cultural barriers. Um, it includes the culture, the culture of society, the stigma and social norms and traditional practices, traditional heal, healing or medications are uh, the reasons for uh, as a social, uh, social cultural barriers. Uh, as I showed in here, uh, age 32 women uh, said, in our community, it's not usual to screen. So women believe that uh, commercial, commercial sex workers and women with multiple sexual partners are at this risk for cancer. Uh, in this uh, society, the women believe that only commercial sex workers and uh, uh, women with uh, multiple sexual partners are at risk. Uh, not other women are not at risk for the cervical cancer. Uh, so it's uh, example. Uh, she, uh, another part is health, health care related barriers. When women go to the health care areas, health institutions, they face the money. Um, many barriers. Uh, one, the privacy issue, another waiting time for the screening, the sex of the service providers and lack of health education, uh, activities of the, the health care providers was another reason as a health care related barrier. Uh, as uh, I listed in here, as, uh, service providers were made. Most of the women preferred uh, to have a female uh, health 
care providers, and, and I prefer to be screened by female professionals. The place for the screening did not keep my privacy, and also there were many health providers were looking at what's going on. As a health care provider, we have described there is no privacy for the screening area and uh, the waiting time for the screening is too long. Uh, there are no adequate uh, health professionals, I think. And okay, nature of the screening, the another uh, uh, reason for barriers as a barrier is nature of the screening. Uh, women did not like the way screening was done. They described us as a weird, area, weird and uncomfortable and unpleasant. Uh, and age 43 women described us uh, uh, here. I had screened two years ago due to my doctor's request. The test environment was uncomfortable and there were no safari screening area. I was exposed to third person uh, the screening uh, area, uncomfortable. They Okay. Uh, for the cervical screening program managers, health managers must uh, work with the community leaders and religious leaders to educate the community on the screening and uh, develop culturally sensitive uh, cervical screening program. Uh, most of the community believe that it's not uh, appropriate in their religion and the community will stigmatize them if they are going to screening areas. So we have to work uh, in this area. I say for the health institutions provider, I must uh, give the clients uh, clear and uh, simple health education and appropriate words uh, and encourage women to communicate effectively about uh, sexual and health related issues with their uh, families and uh, others and to encourage female service providers in the um, screening areas uh, as a reference uh, i have used this and thank you. I would acknowledge. I would. I want to acknowledge that our university and the KC projects and uh, other data collectors who were participated in my study. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Absa, for the timely presentation and uh, very well presented. Uh, before we proceed to the comments, I was hoping to see tables because it's a mixed meta design, and you have the quantitative part right. So where are those findings where you did your association regression analysis? Do you have that? Yes, yes, I had. Okay, uh, so maybe I don't know. Yes, I had the quantity part. Okay, so maybe I think you can share okay. that for uh, Dr. Wonderson and he can display them uh, both okay. because it's better to see okay. uh, the regression analysis, the quantitative part, because there is there are a few things that we can discuss on it okay. from which we can take Lisa. Okay, okay. please share that to uh, Dr. Wanderson okay. and he can project it. So uh, I'll, I'll leave uh, the floor for uh, Dr. Meserat uh, to forward his opinions and suggestions. So Dr. Meserat, over to you. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, Dr. Meseret, we can hear you. Okay. okay. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Meseret. I'm a gynecologist and obstetrician. So that's I'm a gyneco gynecological college senior fellow from case and for hospital. Uh, it's my pleasure uh, to meet you, uh, to participate uh, with you on this study. So thank you, Dr. Yabsra, for your nice for you, okay, presentation and for your initiative on Stating this public health problem, but the ignored one. Okay, it is one of the non-communicable diseases, which, which which is ignored in low and medium income countries, but affecting most of our women. Okay? Thank you for taking the initiative. So, uh, on the study, okay, you may you may you may comment on the ten. Okay, the guest may comment in the ten, but uh, I want to say okay, some important clinical okay parts of the study. Okay. Uh, one thing is said the, the coverage of the study is about about 20.3 okay, and the countrywide coverage is about two percent which is which is okay very low okay the WHO recommendation by 2030 okay we need to achieve okay uh, 90 percent 70 percent screening using the most effective method okay, to to Okay, decrease the, this is public health problem or 
to to make it okay the non public health problem so you can see the number okay two percent and then seventy percent there is there is a gap okay we are we are far okay, below the number which is recommended by the and the other thing okay, most of your steady results are, are similar to that of the 2016 okay, uh, cancer prevention okay, national protocol okay. for example you said the individual level barrier is one is lack of awareness about about the cervical cancer screening about the disease okay lack of awareness so it's put us okay, primary primary prevention method to increase the awareness of the woman is okay, one of the primary prevention methods okay, but on recommendation you didn't okay uh, put that appropriately okay. how can we increase the, the, the public awareness what shall we do okay even what what have you planned to, to 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 decrease that to increase the public awareness to decrease this public health problem? Okay, the other is okay on your study you have you have you have mixed maybe the healthcare related barriers with, with the nature of screening barrier. Okay, I did see the thing about about the nature of screening okay, barrier here. When you say the nature of screening, you, you need to talk about about okay PIA the pap smear okay. What is the problem with that? Here, this is about the okay, privacy. Okay, I had a screen two years ago due to my doctor request. The testing environment was uncomfortable. And there were no separate screen. This is about the privacy, which is related about the healthcare related. Healthcare related. So there is some okay mixation of the, the barrier methods. Okay? What did say? What did say? Say specifically about about the VIA, about the pap smear. Okay, have you compared that? Because at the health centers, commonly we have we have okay, visualization okay, with with under 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 okay, acetic acid application. Yeah, what what was the comment on that? What have you tried to assess about that? The other okay on the healthcare related barriers. Yeah. You didn't assess about the affordability and accessibility of the test results. Is it is it easily accessible? How is the affordability? Yes, individual on individual level, you have said that the cost, but it, it should be put here and so on. You can you can, can okay, project it to the responsible okay government center. Okay? The, 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 the availability, the accessibility as well as the cost. Hmm. Pap smear, okay, it is not available in the, you know, that at, at the public health, health, health centers. It is available only at the private health centers, and it is costly. It costs are more than 1,000. Okay, what do you say on that? The answer is there is one serious thing here, okay? You said on the healthcare-related barrier, okay, the, the attitude of the providers. What is that specifically? Okay, because this needs to be, okay, communicated with the, okay, uh, the responsible government and okay, it should be acted accordingly. What, what is that attitude? Okay, what, what is that attitude? It's very important here. Okay. Mm -hmm. The other, <coughs> you have said that okay. about the age of the, the, the inclusion criteria. Why, why have you excluded the age below 30? Because you know, there is a national guideline, yes, but worldwide guideline, WHO, and there's other guidelines here. Yeah. Uh, screening should be started at 21. Because you did this, 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 this study in a dish where relatively the screening methods are available. Okay, available. So, because it's going to be okay published, and uh, it may it may misinform okay, individuals who are below thirty. Okay, 30. Why why have you excluded those okay, individuals below thirty? Okay, these are these are my points. Okay, I may return okay, to the larger okay, important points. Maybe one 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 more question. On your study, there is there is a word which says opportunistic screening. Okay? Opportunistic screening. Okay. What what does that mean? And how does that affect the, the okay, utilization of this screening?
Okay, thank you, <coughs> doctor. Okay. Uh, okay. Absara, I think uh, I'll proceed and you can reflect at the end. So, uh, Dr. Masarat, are you done with your uh, suggestions and questions? Yep. Okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Masarat. Uh, Dr. Masarat has raised very important um, issues. Uh, I'm not going to repeat those, but um, I'll address the ones that I believe are not addressed. So th the first one is uh, with regard to the rationale of the study, uh, just to uh, emphasize more, uh, there are lots of similar studies in the country and uh, you have to be able to show us what this study is going to add to uh, the already existing literature, especially given that it is um, conducted in one selected subsidy. You know, the justification for that is still not clear for me and it's not written very well on the manuscript as well. So you should try to show us that because when you try to publish, the most important thing, the first, the primary uh, uh, reason to publish a research is when you have something that's worth disseminating because it can add to the existing literature. Uh, indirectly, that means uh, the rationale of your study is justifiable and meaningful. So you should be able to show that uh, in case we have missed it, why Kolfik Aranyo Subsidy, why uh, having after all these uh, research, why uh, repeating something similar? So that should also be reflected on your uh, conclusion, on your uh, what have you found from this study, right? So you should be able to show that. Uh, so um, when we come to the methodology, you say it's, you have used uh, a community-based uh, sequential mixed method design. So, uh, by the way, I, I expect the audience to support you uh, in answering some of the questions. So, um, there are different ways of using a combination of quantitative and qualitative research. So, why do you particularly uh, prefer sequential method? Oh, oh here, uh, by the way, uh, Absra, uh, the document that you have submitted for us for review and uh, the slides are a bit different. Uh, but it's okay. Uh, I think you've made it more clear, I guess, for the audience. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Anderson, can you please show us? Thank you. So, great. So, you've used qualitative and quantitative study designs in a sequential ma manner, right? So, um, are there any other ways of using that? Or can you explain us what sequential uh, method means? Maybe we can make it... Uh, a discussion at this point, Absara, you can respond to this. So uh, what does sequential mean? Uh, how did you actually use these two methods together? Uh, Absara? Okay, thank you for your comment. Okay, <clears throat> I will start from Dr. Anderson's comment. Uh, uh, <clears throat> no, no, I'm sorry, Absara, you'll get back to that. Uh, uh, I just want uh, your opinion on okay. what sequential method means. Uh, how did you use the two uh, study designs together, the qualitative and the quantitative? So you have said sequential. That means there are different other ways of using, combining the two, right? So uh, how did you exactly use the two together? Okay. Uh, I use this method to support, uh, I, I think this method, uh, I prefer this method because uh, I have uh, first I done the quantitative part, then to strengthen the uh, the result of the quantitative the quantitative part. I okay. Uh, can you hear? Uh, I have done the quantitative. Go for the quantitative. Great. Okay. Hello. Yeah, I can hear you. You can proceed. Okay. Okay. Uh, in the first part, I have uh, done the quantitative part. So uh, I, I got the finding of the quantitative uh, study. Uh, then to support this uh, finding, I have to done the uh, the qualitative part to explain more, expl to, to make it more, more explanatory of the uh, finding us the why and the how of the quantitative parts, why these uh, factors are affecting the quite the um, result of the study. 
Okay. So uh, to uh, get in, in this knowledge, in, in idea, and experience, experience of the the, the study participants, I have preferred uh, K four months from the quantity part. So to deeply uh, know the their their reasons for the as a barrier. Okay. So. Uh, uh, you haven't initially planned on using qualitative design. So after you have obtained uh, your quantitative results, then you have uh, decided to add a qualitative part or you have initially planned to use both together at the start of, uh, at the conception of your study. So at the phase of a proposal, which study design uh, you had in mind? Okay, first I, I have done the quantitative part. Uh, the quantitative part, the quantitative part. Okay, so after after you obtain your results and after your analysis results, uh, you have jumped to the qualitative part? Yeah, we're talking uh, with my advisors. Great. Thank you. So, uh, thank you, Absra. Uh, uh, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll continue with my suggestions and you can respond later uh, for that. So, uh, there are three different uh, ways uh, we can use uh, uh quantitative and qualitative uh, study designs together. The first one is what we call uh, triangulation. I have uh, dropped it on the chat box, you can see it there. So uh, in triangulation, what we're doing is we're conducting both qualitative and quantitative research at the same time, uh, even at the beginning of the design of the study, that's the idea. And we collect data simultaneously for both quantitative and qualitative. Uh, but sometimes uh, we do not have any interest in conducting qualitative research. We just do our quantitative uh, research. And after we obtain the numbers, we run the analysis and we get the results, we might find something that's surprising or something unique that needs further exploration. So in those types of situations, um, we can add qualitative research so that it can explain those odd results or those uh, some uh, unique findings. So uh, we call that explanatory to explain our unique findings. And the third scenario is our initial uh, interest is to conduct a qualitative research. And after, uh, so the whole point is, uh, this is usually picked when uh, the uh, topic that we're studying is uh, new or uh, it's uh, for which we don't have clear set of variables uh, on the topic. We don't have a lot of knowledge uh, to design a tool a quantitative tool that can capture enough information. So in those scenarios, we first conduct qualitative research, try to learn about the subject matter more and understand about it. And once we understand about the subject matter, we develop tools, variables based on our research finding, the qualitative, and then we use those tools uh, to collect quantitative data and um, generate a larger scale data, which can be generalized to a larger group of population. So these are the different ways that we use. And I'm sure most master's students don't do, uh, don't go this far uh, to um, to confirm their findings. And so what uh, you did is more of a, an explanatory. Yes, sequ sequential, it could be explanatory or exploratory. So what you did was explanatory. Uh, so after you obtained your quantitative findings, you have uh, added a qualitative research so that you can further uh, strengthen the finding of your studies. But it would have been great if you showed us the reason that you have conducted qualitative research. What was so unique? So. Uh, or that you would like to obtain a qualitative data? And did you uh, find an answer for that unique question? Uh, some unique finding, was it worth it conducting the qualitative research? Uh, you can reflect on that at the end. So when we come to the population, uh, Dr. Wendelson, can you please um, put the slide on the eligibility criteria for the quantitative research on the table? Yeah, for the exclusion criteria, um, uh, I don't know, medical, physical inability, women who refuse to participate. I don't know. This is a community-based study. I'm not sure what exactly medical or physical inability means. Uh, so if, if we're talking about, I don't know, physical inability, shouldn't be a reason to exclude someone from any study unless it's like particularly related to the nature of the study that is going to make them uh, ineligible. Uh, with regard to um, medical uh inability, if it is to mean that patients are not fit medically, they're critically ill, again, we don't expect someone like this to be uh, 
uh, like to live in a normal community. They are rather in a hospital setup. So if we're talking about mental status, I mean, was it confirmed that they were unable to get involved in a study, uh, their mental condition? So these are very debatable subjects. Uh, and we should be very careful when we state them because it might reflect, it might show that our research is not inclusive and might not be generalizable uh, in a lot of things. And a refusal to participate, um, it's not appropriate. Why? I'm going to get back to the audience. So if someone refuses to participate in your study, and in a quantitative research, for example, uh, what's the right thing to do? Uh, are we expected to exclude that participant or what are we expected to do? So let's say you have uh, used some sort of uh, uh, participant selection criteria, uh, systematic, simple random sampling method, and uh, you go to that patient. And then if that participant refuses to participate in the study, uh, are we expected to exclude that participant or just skip that participant, uh, consider him or her as um, and uh, like, uh, okay, Dr. Rondosan, thank you. Uh, you can explain. So on uh, the exclusion criteria, we can say like those who refuse cannot be included in the exclusion criteria because already we have uh, the non response rate that we are going to calculate for the sample size. Thank you, right? So uh, when we calculate sample size in any type of uh, sample size calculation, uh, we uh, add non response rate because we know that 100% of the selected participants won't be like interested to engage in our research. So some will uh, uh, default, some will say uh, they're not interested to participate. So those people are non respondents. That's not a criteria to exclude them. So when somebody says no, we just keep that person in, we go to the next. Uh, uh, selected participants. So that way, these people are non respondents and should not be excluded. Uh, if we keep excluding those who say no, that means we're replacing them with the next eligible person who is actually not initially planned to be in involved in the study. And we'll finally end up with 100% response rate. That's not the goal. We know that there is some sort of non response depending on the nature of the study. Uh, the sensitivity of the subject matter, the nature of the data collection, we can consider uh, from 10%, even up to 30%, for, for example, in chart review studies and in uh, especially the chart keeping is like uh, manual. And if, the, if it goes uh, way back, like five, 10 years, we might consider up to 30% uh, non-response rate. So uh, non-response is something that we always expect and they should not be excluded from our study. With regard to the sample size, um, uh, show us this sample size calculation. And uh, what was done for the quantitative research is simply single population uh, sample size calculation for single population proportion formula. So that's for our descriptive objective, which is to find uh, the level of or the magnitude of uh, uh, those uh, who did not receive cervical cancer screening, right? So why was, um, I, I think you should go one slide back. The proportion that you used was uh, for knowledge of cervical cancer screening. What we're assessing and as, an, as an outcome here is not um, knowledge of cervical cancer screening. There's actually a bit of a confusion with regard to the outcome. We will see that, but here knowledge is not our outcome. And the proportion that we should be looking for from other studies is the practice or the barrier proportion, not uh, the knowledge. So this is this should be corrected, and uh, we have talked about this in the pre in the previous sessions as well. So when we have a cross sectional study design, we should be able to present um, what uh, the, uh, the for the inferential objective. We should be able to calculate a double population proportion formula, uh, and we should get the sample for the inferential objective and compare that with a, a result from our single population proportion formula and pick the largest number. So uh, it's very important that uh, we should we calculate sample size for the inferential objective using a formula with the power. Uh, and for the qualitative research, you say that there are we, you took 15 participants. Um, but instead just you know when you say 15, uh, we know that uh, it works with a rule of saturation. 
and it should be explained you know someone might say why 15 so uh you should explain that it's because the saturation information saturation was rich so while we're on this slide uh for the when when we always present that we're doing a mixed method study design uh we have to explain what specific study designs we have used for both the quantitative and the qualitative for the quantitative as you can see uh she's used cross-sectional design analytic cross-sectional design and for the qualitative it says purposively selected key inform key informant individuals from the quantitative study so uh key informant interview is that uh study design are you are you comfortable with that um qualitative research has its own study design just like the quantitative one, there are different study designs. Uh, we call them actually study approaches, not study designs. There are uh, a difference in terminology between uh, quantitative and qualitative research. So the proper study uh, approach that uh, we have used for our study should be written. So in this case, it could be qualitative content analysis, thematic analysis, grounded theory method, and other uh, different approaches. So that should be specified. Key, inform uh, key informant interview and others, these are data collection methods and not study designs. So the proper study design that you have used should be written. So with regard to the variable, the, the most important question, what was the outcome variable uh, for the audience? What was her outcome variable or her dependent variable? anybody i mean you've been following the entire time so what was the outcome variable anybody what was she trying to assess as the main outcome variable bearer okay utilization great bearer to utilization okay what else? You know, when you when you see the results section in others, yeah, from the topic, we started with barriers to utilization of cervical cancer screening uh, method. So it seems like uh, the barriers to service utilization are uh, the outcome variable. And we're going to assess what are the factors that lead to those barriers, right? So it, it seems a bit confusing, but what she actually did was... Um, Right, thank you. So 20.3% of eligible women screened for a cervical cancer screening. So it's actually their utilization, right? Not the bearers. The bearers are not her outcome variable, rather it's the utilization of cervical cancer screening, which is simply their practice, right? So that should, I think that should be corrected. That's what has been leading some uh, in confusion throughout the presentation. So our outcome is the practice or utilization of the cervical cancer screening and what are the barriers uh, to the utilization. So if we can uh, make that clear, uh, knowledge has been assessed and also practice. I think Dr. Meseret can tell us what uh, practice or utilization means. How do you define utilization? Is it just a one-time screening of for cervical cancer or as per the recommendation, what's the recommendation? When do you say someone has utilized cervical cancer screening or practices the screening? What does it mean? Is it just a one-time screening or uh, does it consider the frequency and other factors? So knowledge has been addressed as um, a variable, but we didn't see anything um, for the measurement of knowledge. We, uh, you know, questions like knowledge, practice, attitude, um, uh, are variables that need measurement with a number of questions, not just one yes or no question. So how was knowledge assessed based on what standard tool and how was it finally graded? Uh, those kind of information were missing. I think the variable part and uh, the operational definition part are not presented. That's why if it was presented, knowledge, practice, and uh, other relevant variables uh, should have been defined. So uh, when we go to the data analysis plan, uh, detail analysis method should be written. So what was actually, so it looks like you just jumped into the result and discussion, but uh, when we uh, present, when we use a mixed method design, we have to present 
every methodology aspect for both the quantitative and the qualitative part. So when we come to data analysis, we have to present what type of analysis method we have used for uh, the quantitative uh, research and what type of analysis method we used for the qualitative research. So the qualitative research is basically written on as a study, uh, as a mixed method study design, but most of the things are a, a bit neglected. Uh, we have to be able to see the clear uh, study approach or study design that was used uh, and all other parts, including uh, their eligibility, the study population, um, uh, and the data analysis uh, method that we have used. What kind of analysis method was it used? You only write the uh, open code software uh, was used, but what was the analysis method? Is it content analysis, thematic analysis? What other uh, methods of uh, qualitative data analysis did you use? That should be clear. And also for the quantitative, for the quantitative part, how was data summarized? Uh, how was uh, data uh, regression analysis done? What type of uh, regression model did you use? And did you test assumptions? What was the software used? Um, all of these things should have been presented, but it looks like there is. Uh, some sort of mix up. So when we come to the results part, I think it would be great if we can display the Word document. Uh, Dr. Wonderson, did you receive the Word document? Not yet. I'm waiting for the Word document. I didn't okay. receive it. Uh, Absolutely. If you have the Word document now, you can share. Otherwise, I can also share. So, um, while we're on the slide, uh, with regard to uh, result presentation, every research, whatever uh, type of research it is, it should follow some sort of pattern so that it's easy to read. And it's also easy to uh, follow the research question and get answers to the research question. So every time we present our result, we should start with the outcome. Uh, I mean, the description of the study participants. So uh, here we have uh, uh, two different things to describe. The first one is uh, the participants for our quantitative research. So uh, in terms of their social demographic characteristics, their medical illness, their knowledge, attitude, uh, other barriers, they should be assessed. And that result has to be presented as a descriptive table using frequency with percentage or using numeric summary measures. And the qualitative study participants, they should be, uh, they should be presented, the, their uh, characteristics should be presented uh, on a table separately. So there are 15 participants. Who are these? Uh, not their names, but their age. It could be their marital status, other uh, relevant uh, factors, their educational status, um, other their sexual history. Uh, just the relevant demographic variables has to be presented so that we can follow uh, what kind of people were in, involved in the uh, in-depth interview and was it uh, enough? We can assess that. So whenever you present your result, you have to start with the descriptive statistics presentation. And then after that, you have to present the overall utilization of cervical cancer screening, which you did, but the flow has to be after the description of the study participants. And while you're doing this, there is no need uh, to present uh, the qualitative research findings because the qualitative research findings are there uh, to triangulate the bears, right? Uh, the results uh, for the bears for cervical cancer ut uh, screening utilization. So uh, where we need them is like with the regression results for the quantitative research not the descriptive statistics. I mean, descriptive statistics is just descriptive. Yes, great. Thank you. It's, it's because you did not present it. It's nice. Uh, Dr. Anderson, just show us the tables. So yes, uh, yes. So uh, we expect this type of uh, tables. And then after you present these uh, descriptive findings, which doesn't need any further confirmation from a qualitative research, because these are just description of who the participants are. It doesn't need any expl explanation or justification or triangulation from a qualitative finding. So after you present this, you go to the uh, utilization percentage. That also doesn't need any confirmation. After that, you go to what are the barriers for the utilization, which are the factors associated with uh, utilization. So 
uh, can you display the regression analysis? Now, he, uh, now is the time. Yes, pairs of cervical cancer screening. Great. Uh, now we expect a regression table. Uh, can you please uh, display the regression table? So after you present the regression table, you triangulate that those findings. You support the regression analysis findings with the qualitative uh, research find um, uh, the qualitative interview findings. So there seems to be. Uh, a mix up of the presentation of the findings. Uh, can you please tell him where uh, these are just uh, descriptive findings? Uh, I, I just want to, to, to show the table for the audience and I want to get their opinion on something. It would be a good opportunity for us to practice. Um, interpretation for regression results. Maybe, um, I think I, I have the, the regression table. Uh, is that okay if I display it, uh, Absara? Uh, I, I think I can share it uh, from my side. Um, can you see the, I think you can see the table, right? Uh, Dr. Anderson, you can see the table, right? Yeah, thank you, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, so um, I want a volunteer to interpret these findings. So I'm sure you all have just at least a few a few exposure on epidemiology courses at least. So this is a, a two by two table showing uh, the factors, the bearers, the potential bearers that affect cervical cancer screening utilization. So uh, the first one, uh, we got a volunteer. Okay, you want me? Okay, sure, okay. Uh, I think maybe it's your device, but can you see it now? So let's start with the first one. So number of sexual partner, uh, thank you. So number of sexual partner, uh, one and those with uh, two or more sexual partners. So we have the two by two table. This is a very nice way of presenting regression analysis result because the audience should be able to, the reader should be able to calculate the crude odds ratio uh, from the two by two table. So this is a very good trend. Whenever you publish your articles, uh, you should make sure that the two by two table of the outcome and the exposure variable should be presented this way. So that if you have any doubts uh, about the results that are presented, like could be the adjusted ratio or the crude odds ratio, you can calculate it for yourself and compare the findings. So here uh, she did not present the crude odds ratio value, but uh, it should be added here. So if we have the crude odds ratio result here, we it would be easy for us to compare the findings as well. Uh, so that's also the trend. So it's all right. The adjusted odds ratio uh, also can be presented. So uh, is there anybody who can interpret this finding? So this is a significant finding. She did great here. She made um, the p-values that are significant, bold, and she put asterisks. This is a common trend. Uh, this is good. So um, how do you interpret this finding? Anybody? Uh, anybody? You can raise your hand and we can, we'll give you the permission to speak. Anybody? Or if you're not comfortable, you can just uh, type in the answer. So uh, let's make it simple. You don't have to put the exact interpretation of the odds ratio that she calculated, but rather, so what does it imply? So having two or more sexual partners does it increase or decrease their screening behavior, their screening practice utilization? Okay, uh, uh, Dr. Dawit? Dr. Um, Dr. Wondosan, can you please give him the permission? Uh, Dr. Dawit. Great. So, uh, so 
yes. So simply uh, those with uh, two or more partners. Yeah, if if there are like attendees who are not familiar with odds ratio interpretation, uh, we can, uh, okay. Yeah, I am trying to give you the permission, uh, Dr. Dawit, but I don't seem to be able to find you. Yeah. So I think now you can unmute uh, yourself and you can speak. Okay, okay thank you for the chance. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, with this p-value uh, for uh, say people, uh, clients with a sexual partner greater than or equal to is high likely like four times likely to be screened for cervical say, rather than those who have one sexual partner. Thank you very much. Uh, exactly. The, uh, it's implying there is an increased uh, their behavior. Like the, it's when they have two or more sexual partners, their tendency to utilize the service, the screening service increases, right? So uh, uh, we can interpret it in terms of the odds ratio that others have presented it. I don't want to push anyone to get the exact interpretation because it's something that we can just exercise. Thank you very much, Dr. Dawit. Uh, Dariba, I have given you the chance to speak. You can you can continue, please. Uh, so in the meantime, uh, Dariba, D, you can you can you can continue. Um, um, I gave you the permission. So in the meantime, I want you to interpret the second significant finding, which is for history of STI. So what does that mean? History of STI? You can see that, right? Yeah. Right, so those with history of S uh, STD, um, they're, uh, yeah, yeah. Actually not uh, in terms of protective factor, may not be the best word to explain it, but their behavior towards practicing or utilizing the screening service is low, right? So we're saying those with history of STD, uh, they practice way or they utilize the cervical cancer screening uh, methods less likely, right? Please also uh, just take a look at the other results also. So it says that, have you heard about cervical cancer screening? Yes, so those who said yes, uh, their practice is lower. So uh, why we're saying lower is because odds ratio is, since it's the ratio, uh, null value or no relationship value is one. So when every value uh, of odds ratio is above one, and when the confidence interval doesn't cross one, uh, it says it's telling you that um, there is uh, an increased odds of having the outcome. So in this case, which is uh, practicing when the odds ratio is less than one and the confidence interval doesn't cross one, then it's telling you that the odds of uh, having the outcome is lower. So in this case, which is uh, utilizing the cervical cancer screening method. So in this case, uh, this is a significant p-value, 0.04. And uh, here we have 0 0.773, but look at the confidence interval. The confidence interval crosses one, right? So if it crosses one, it, it's, it's telling us that even if our um, uh, exact value is 0 0.773, Every uh, statistical value has is uh, has its own boundaries, lower and upper boundaries within which uh, our normal result um, lies. So if that boundary crosses one, then it's it's telling you that uh, there is uh, this factor is protective and not associated, and then again risk factor. So one uh, variable or one exposure cannot have all the three effects in uh, on one outcome. So that's why if it crosses your uh, one, the 95% confidence interval crosses one, then it's uh, you can be sure that your p-value is also non-significant. So Absra, you should check if the analysis that you have run is correct because this p-value and the confidence interval that we have here doesn't go together. 
and for the other variables, just like the STD, those who expect to practice better are actually practicing less. So it kind of doesn't make sense. Uh, this could be because of um, uh, the use of the reference category. Maybe you have flipped the reference categories and you have presented it um, in a reverse way. You have to check that. Sometimes when we code our variables and we when we don't change the reference category uh, or when we don't pay attention to that, uh, we might make mistakes. The result is correct, but the way we present it might make it look like wrong. So um, exactly, it, I guess it's, it, it's not logical. So uh, the role of clinical uh, practice in terms of interpreting our findings relies here because uh, just because we get some statistical outputs doesn't mean we have to interpret it and accept it the way it is. Uh, we have to uh, review it uh, in the context of the clinical practice, the clinical knowledge that we have. So if it doesn't make sense, if the result doesn't make, make sense, it means there is something wrong with, with our coding or the way we enter our variables. So we have to go back and check and try to see uh, where the problem is and fix it. So it should be fixed. It needs yeah a lot of fixing. And this variable, uh, it just doesn't make sense. You can't have such type of p-value with a confidence interval that crosses one. It's impossible. So uh, there's definitely something wrong with it uh, and it should be checked. Uh, so uh, I think um, we have gone through most of the things and uh, with regard to uh, the use of the terminology predictors, I think we have said this in the past two presentations as well. Predictors is a very strong term for a cross-sectional study design. So we should refrain from using predictors, prognostic factors, um, uh, uh, cause effects, impact, uh, risk factors. These are terms that we should save for uh, a higher uh, study designs like cohort and experimental study design. So for cross-sectional and case control, uh, the safest word is associated factor. So please use that and avoid using the word predictors or determinants. And when you cite the uh, qualitative uh, quotes, you have put uh, only their age. Uh, that's not the trend. Normally you have to put them as like participant one, participant two, uh, participant three, because they all are like homogeneous. They all are eligible women. So I think participant one, two, three, four, up to 15 is the proper way of labeling them. If uh, there were like different in terms of uh, their uh, Behavior, for, for example, if you have included healthcare professionals, you can uh, give them a different uh, name, label, and you can also uh, put that as well. But just putting their name doesn't make sense. And the table that I suggested, if you put the qualitative participants in one table, all the 15 with their character six, then we can go back and see who's participant one. So we can go back and refer and see who said what. Uh, but just putting their age doesn't make sense. You have to give them a code like participant one, two, three, and four. And uh, when we present, uh, there seems to be um, the discussion with regard to the discussion. A discussion is all about making meaning out of our data. But what was presented is just a uh, comparison of the findings with other research. Uh, that's the last thing we want to do. The most important thing is to try to put the result in terms of uh, the science, the existing science that we know in terms of the policy, international and national targets that we have. For example, uh, what's the utilization, the service utilization um, target at the national level? Have we made that? What's the international target? Uh, these are the things that we should worry about, not just comparing with other results. Even if it is better than other results, it just doesn't make it uh, a best finding or it just doesn't tell us uh, that we're doing great. So uh, to say that we're doing great or not, we should compare our findings with uh, a meaningful targets like national, international targets. And most importantly, we have to compare our findings with the existing scientific evidence so that uh, because the overall point of conducting research is to make sure that we have met uh, a meaningful uh, scientific targets so that our patients can have a better outcome. So uh, on the conclusion part, uh, you talked about low awareness and other things. I think uh, we haven't even measured knowledge properly. So our conclusion 
and recommendation, they have to be result driven. Uh, Dr. Maseret has also mentioned it. You have talked about opportunity, uh, opportunistic screening, which we haven't seen anywhere. It just appeared on the conclusion part. So what does it mean? Uh, our conclusion and recommendation, they have to be result driven. And most of the things that are recommended are not based on our results. So when we when we say result driven discussion and recommendation, uh, we're talking about the regression result that we have found. So we have been studying about the bears for cervical cancer screening utilization. So uh, what were the bears from our regression results? Are those results confirmed with the qualitative findings? And then those variables, those findings are the ones upon which we should conclude and give recommendation on. The rest, uh, it, it will be just a simple personal reflection, not a scientific uh, reflection. So it should be revised that way. So I have tried to make it, um, I don't know, more focused, my comments. Uh, other comments, I can forward it for uh, Absara herself. So uh, I think now I'll, I'll leave the floor for uh, the audience to ask their question. Uh, some of them have been asking, so I'll give the opportunity for the audience uh, to reflect their questions. Uh, Dr. Ronderson, please share the PowerPoint if they want to discuss on that. Thank you. So uh, anybody? Oh, it, by the way, it doesn't have to be just a question. If there is anything that's not clear, or that seems to be confusing, you can ask anything related to uh, the subject matter that's presented. And I see that a lot of you have a very good research experience. Uh, your answers are amazing. And I'm happy that to see that you are, you are following and you're asking good questions. Thank you. Uh, so it says, what's your final conclusion? I think she's presented that. Yeah, the question is, was it really result-driven conclusion? But uh, she can reflect on that. Thank you. Anybody? Anybody? Or, okay, did you learn something from the discussion? Yeah, I, I think someone asked, should we expect non-response rates if we're doing a research based on secondary data like medical record? Uh, yes, because, you know, even when you are conducting um, a research on secondary data, um, when you are conducting research on secondary data, uh, unless uh, if you, the recommendation for a chart review or record review is to include every record unless there is a resource constraint. Uh, otherwise, uh, if there is a, research, a resource constraint, you have to calculate sample size depending on the design that you want to use, the analysis plan that you have in mind. And then after you calculate your sample size, you just use the same procedure of sampling like the primary data. So uh, you might select some uh, charts and you go and search for those charts. If those charts are missing, you will skip that and uh, exclude. I mean, you you will skip that and you look for the second a selected chart. So in that case, you will definitely have non response or actually the proper term to use is not non response, but record loss or chart loss, you can call that. So it's definitely expected even uh, the uh, chart loss that you're going to get is much higher than the primary uh, data that we collect because charts can be lost due to different reasons, especially if we're using a manual chart system. Tola has explained it very well. It's very nice. You can also, uh, by the way, you can also learn about these things on our uh, MRL Telegram group. Uh, we have a post on uh, uh, non response and other sampling issues. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, is if the outcome of the study is practice, is it acceptable to take a p value for knowledge? Yes, Magdalawit. Uh, I think if you if you have attended the entire session, that's one of the question. Uh, if the outcome is practice, then the proportion that we we should use for our uh, first sample size calculation is proportion of uh, practice, not knowledge. We have also asked that, and that should be corrected. I think she can take that as a suggestion. Uh, is a dependent variable to bear and utilization? 
yeah, that, 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 that was the confusion we all had. Actually, when you try to see the study, what was done was actually um, utilization. And then what were the barriers for utilization were studied. So the barriers were more in this scenario, uh, like factors, not the outcomes. That's what we suggested. It should be corrected that way. Okay, we present that. Okay. In question form, same concern. Yeah, p value, the ratio. Yes. Yeah, I think most of the things are the things that we have discussed. It would have been nice, by the way, next time, especially for those who are doing their data analysis, we're going to present the data and see how they analyzed it so that we can for our opinion, like uh, the one that we're talking about, like the coding, the reference category uh, choice and others in practice so that it will make more sense, especially those with limited exposure uh, in using uh, softwares. Why you use design effect? So uh, Absara, you, you can reflect on that, why you use design effect. How was the eligible woman selected? I think um, the Riba, um, the Riba, you can ask, I can give you the permission. I, I have given you the permission. You can ask and Absara after the Riba's question, uh, you're not expected uh, to, ref to reflect or answer on every question rest. This is a discussion platform. Most of it, you can just uh, take it as an assignment and work on it. But if there are things that you'd like to clear up on, uh, I'll give you the chance. Dariba, I'm trying. I just unmuted you, but I don't know what happened from your side. Maybe you can text it. You, you can drop it on the chat box and we'll get to it. Uh, thank you. I think now you can speak. Okay. Uh, I'm Dariba Dibaba. It is a nice uh, presentation and I'm also happy with the topics and the interesting area, particularly in clinical setup. So uh, saying this one, Generally, the research is a skeleton of the research. Total is a methodology, and the research, uh, the result part should be revised because it is not self explanatory, particularly the methodology part, uh, as well as uh, how, how the approach of the qualitative for qualitative part, how we can determine the sample size, what should be the uh, the guidance, how we, sh we should approach. Most of the time, I have heard and I have read the saturation idea in qualitative part, but uh, in this research, the sample size for qualitative part is 15. So how uh, the, the author of this research decide 15 is sample size. The other is the last model, as we have seen from the last model, uh, totally the last model or the regression model should be revised. So this is my uh, question. Thank you very much, Driva. Very valid points, which has also been raised. Uh, very valid points. Thank you very much. Uh, by the way, it's really nice to, to hear that uh, these many people are interested uh, in like attending and responding and giving feedback for such kind of presentations because this is exactly the proper platform to learn about research and I'm happy to see uh, this many people engage and interact um, with just three sessions so I think uh, Abstra I'll give you the chance you can take uh, five minutes and just reflect on a few things that you like just don't you're not expected to answer any of the questions like step by step okay there are things that you like to reflect you can and you can take the rest as an assignment to think on okay uh i think abstract connection uh is poor she's getting in and out so um, if she gets back, uh, we'll give her the chance to reflect on the questions that are raised. So uh, let me give you just uh, two minutes before we post um, the post test link. If you have any other questions, please. 
Can I say something about the utilization? Sure, sure, Dr. Masalas, please. So, as you know, the government pregnant lady, if she has one ANC contact, is considered as coverage. But here in cervical cancer, the sensitivity of these case screening methods are not as such high. Okay, the maximum is 54%. So single screening method is not as such different from, from not having screening. So we say a woman has utilized the screening, she abides per, per the scale, per the recommendation. That means every three to five years, okay, uh, based, based on the type of the, the screening, starting from 21 years of age or two years after the onset of sexual contact. Okay, sexual contact. Great. Thank you, Dr. Masarit. Exactly. Uh, what the commonest problem that we usually encounter on research is that, uh, like in terms of measuring our variables, especially our outcome variable, it should be standardized and acceptable. If it is not, then it won't add to the literature. And I don't know what if, what's the relevance of conducting that research, right? So yeah, th that was what I wanted you to reflect on. Thank you. So if you have other things to reflect on, uh, you can continue. Yes, I wanted to hear about that, that opportunistic screening because it's very important to kill, but okay. I think she's just... Yeah, I think Absra has an mm -hmm. uh, uh, issue with her connection. Uh, she's texting. So uh, I think she, she can take that assignment as well. And the point is, um, I, I know you. a lot of you are... Uh, applying to present, but we try to pick cases that are going to give, um, that are a bit different from the ones that we have already presented so that the audience can learn from different types of designs and different types of studies time after time. So if there are, if any of you, you are working on a comparable type of research, like using a mixed design with an outcome uh, that is to be measured in a more standardized way, like practice utilization, uh, knowledge attitude, then take all the comments that we have forwarded because it's very important uh, to apply these concepts in any type of uh, similar research. So just to remind you uh, we, that, uh, that I have uh, dropped it on the chat box, uh, whenever we use qualitative and quantitative uh, studies together, we can use them at the same time. Uh, we call that triangulation. And uh, we can start with the quantitative one and after we conduct our research, if we find something very unique finding, we can follow that with a qualitative research so that we can have um, a better understanding of our unique findings. So we call that explanatory. Uh, so we are trying to explain the unique findings that we get from our quantitative research. And sometimes uh, when we're studying uh, a research topic, which is not very well known and for which we don't have like clear cut variables, and we have, when we have a limited knowledge about the problem, we can start with the qualitative, learn about it, understand about it, and then we can uh, develop tool variables from the qualitative findings and we can conduct a quantitative research. So we call that exploratory. So uh, these are the uh, three potential uh, combination of qualitative and quantitative research. So uh, just uh, to remind, do that. So, um, I think uh, we'll keep the session open uh, uh, till 8.30. In the meantime, uh, we'll drop you the link to the post test. And if you have any question, please drop those questions and we can address it now or another time on our platforms. Uh, Dr. Dr. Masara, thank you very much. Uh, so uh, the, the whole point is we, when we uh, conduct research, uh, we just address it from the research perspective, the statistics, the epidemiology, and we forget uh, to take the very important opinion from our clinicians. So uh, this collaborative platform is meant to bring clinicians and researchers together, and you have provided very fruitful comments and suggestions. Thank you very much for that. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for this very okay, impressive platform. Uh, thank you all, the night night to all. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you everyone for attending the session.